connection with the lecture that we will hear this afternoon, we will read together from the second chapter of the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 2. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Then it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountain, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruners. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east, and are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they please themselves in the children of strangers. Their land also is full of silver and gold, neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. Their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. And the mean man boweth down, and the great man humbleth himself. Therefore forgive them not. Enter into the rock, and hide thee in the dust, for fear of the Lord, and for the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. And upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, and upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills that are lifted up, and upon every high tower, and upon every fenced wall, and upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all pleasant pictures. And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. And the idols he shall utterly abolish. And they shall go into the hope holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terror of the earth. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold which they made each one for himself to worship to the moles and to the bats to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terror of the earth. Cease ye from man, whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? <clears throat> Ask about Peter to open the prayer, please. Eternal God, once again we, thy believing ch children, do approach thee, bowing thy heads in submission unto thee, realizing that thou art the great creator and sustainer of all life, and unto thee is all honor and glory due. We thank thee that thou hast once again allowed us to gather in this manner around thy holy word, without fear of molestation from the outside world, that we might study and learn these things which thou hast had ri written for us. We ask that thou place thy blessing upon this assembly here today, that all things done may be in harmony with thy holy word, that from this endeavor we might all gain strength and knowledge to become more pleasing servants of thine. Guide us toward that day of thy son's return, and we pray on that day of judgment that thou wilt remember us in favor and mercy as sons and daughters of thine, that thou wilt forgive our many shortcomings and grant unto us a place within that kingdom. We call you to ask these things and thank thee for thy blessings.
Good afternoon, brothers and sisters and Sunday School scholars. We have no guests, which is not surprising. A tiny strip of land sandwiched between the sea and the desert at the eastern end of the Mediterranean is probably the most disputed piece of territory on Earth. For thousands of years that has been fought over, in the last 50 years or so, it has been the focus of international attention as rival peoples have claimed their rights to the area. Not long ago, there were promising moves towards reconciliation, and bitter enemies signed treaties of peace and security, yet the tension has continued to surface. There is no doubt these days when we watch the news that Israel is hated by many nations. Many nations publicly state their hatred, hatred toward the Jew. They are, like prophesied, a byword among the people. An example of this can be seen in the president of Iran lately. Within the past few weeks, he has publicly stated that Israel is a disgrace to humanity or a disgrace to the world and has renewed his vow to wipe them off the map and from even being in existence. Anyone with true Bible knowledge can realize how stupid of a comment that is, for God has made many promises with this great nation Israel. Unfortunately, due to mainly ignorance and man's attempt to fix all their own problems, many world leaders are against Israel and act as if they're the cause for the world's problems, and especially the Jews are the blame for the turmoil in the Middle East. It is my intent today to go over many biblical passages to prove to those who aren't familiar with biblical prophecy that the Jewish race, or Israel, are the apple of God's eye, who divinely protected through many trials and persecutions as a nation, will be a glorious and prosperous people who will gain the respect and attention of everybody in the world in due time. God made promises to these people which can basically be described as a plan for life on earth. I ask that you give your undivided attention to the quoted scripture and the facts about the nation's survival against all the odds, and you will leave here with a new perspective on the land of Israel and Israel as a people blessed by God. Going back to the days of Moses, the old man stood high on the hillside, the Israelites below him hushed and expectant as they waited for him to continue. These were his people, the flock that he had shepherded over for 40 years. Moses' voice rang clear through the desert air. He said, the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession. Out of all the peoples that are on the face of the earth, that's Deuteronomy 7 and 6. It was not because you were more in number than any other people, he reminded them. Numbers have never mattered to God. Quality is more important than quantity to him. It is because the Lord loves you, he went on, and is keeping the oath which he swore to your fathers, that the Lord had brought you out with a mighty hand. That's verses 7 and 8. How he had loved them, in spite of their rebellious spirit, their hankering after the Egypt from which he had called them out. Those decades of eating manna, enduring discipline and wandering in the wilderness, had finally forged the children of Israel into a unique nation, a people with a history and a destiny. Was Moses being too starry-eyed, too close to the Israelites to see things in perspective when he spoke of them as a chosen people? The answer is a resounding no. Over 1,000 years later, even after that same rebellious spirit had driven them into captivity in Babylon, Zechariah the prophet could still write to the people of Judah, saying, Thus said the Lord of hosts, He who touches you touches the apple of his eye. That's Zechariah 2 verse 8. There is nothing we treasure more than our eyesight. To touch the eyeball causes instant pain and a violent reaction. This is how God felt when the nations had oppressed the people he loved. 500 years later still, after the Jews had killed God's son and rejected the gospel, the Apostle Paul asks, has God rejected his people? He replies emphatically, by no means. They are beloved, he declares, for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. That's Romans 11, verse 1, 28, and 29. Like the father of the prodigal son in Jesus' parable, God's love for his people has never changed, even though they have often made him sad. The idea that God has a special relationship with the, nations of Israel, with the nation of Israel does not go down well today. Our society is preoccupied with equality and equal opportunity. Why should God choose one nation out of the many that fill the globe? What is so special about that tiny strip of land between the continents, the country we now call Israel, for which he seems to have such a deep regard? A short answer to this question would be that as God is the creator, 
He does not have to answer to us for what he does. We view his work from a very short time span compared with the eternity through which he operates. We must be prepared to wait a very long time if we want to know why he does things a certain way. It is like walking past a building site when a new town hall or office block is being built. We peer through the gap in the fencing and all we see is mud, holes, cranes, scaffolding, noisy activity with no obvious end product. We know, of course, the activity is not really aimless. Tucked away in the contractor's cabin are drawers of plans and flowcharts listing the dates by which the foundation, walls, roof, and services will be completed. If we were good at technical drawing, we could leaf through the plans and visualize the final appearance of the building, admiring the grace and practicality of the design. But at first sight, just walking by, we may go home and grumble that the council is wasting its money. Looking at God's work is very like that. We shall never see things in perspective unless we step inside the cabin and look at the plans. And that is where I hope to help in this lecture, to open up God's great design revealed in the Bible. God has a set of plans and a schedule with the order of operations carefully laid out. The building he is constructing is called the kingdom of God. And one day, when all the stages of preparation are complete, he will reveal an earth filled with grace and beauty, inhabited by people from all the past centuries who have loved and waited for him. With Jesus as their king, they will govern the peoples of the earth in an age of peace, when at last God's will is done. And the nation of Israel will be seen in that day to have been the framework of the structure, the joists and beams on which many rooms and corridors depend. Let us look through the Bible then to see from God's point of view what has been happening this last 4,000 years. In the passage we quoted from Romans chapter 11, Paul said that the Jews were beloved for the sake of their, father, for their forefathers. The man all Jews look back to as the father of their race is Abraham, the son of Terah. Abraham was brought up in a city called Ur, close to the river Euphrates, in what is now Iraq. At an age when most people are thinking of retiring, Abraham had a visitation from the Lord who asked him to leave Ur the Chaldees. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house, he said, to the land that I will show you. That was Genesis 12 and 1. It was a lot to ask of anyone, but with what turned out to be a characteristic faith in God, Abraham sold up and moved out. Hold on a sec. Hit the wrong button. of anyone, but with what turned out to be a characteristic faith in God, Abraham sold up and moved out, not knowing, to begin with, exactly where he was going. After a long trek up the Euphrates, he was guided to the west and south until he came to a 200-mile long strip of land between the Mediterranean and the Dead Sea, mountainous in the center, with coastal plains to the west and Sinai Desert to the south. No one appreciated at that stage the strategic position of the land of Israel sighted at the junction of three great land masses. Nor could they foresee the beauty it will have one day, when the desert is made to blossom as the rose. That was all tucked away in the drawer of plans. God promised Abraham simply, to your descendants I will give this land. That was Genesis 12 and 7. There was an irony about this statement. Although Abraham and his wife had been happily married for many years, to their intense regret, they had had no children. Yet God was promising the land to their descendants. The promise was repeated and expanded as the years passed. But Abraham and his wife moved around the land in their tents, still childless and no nearer to possessing the land than when they had first arrived. One night Abraham had opportunity to question the messenger from the Lord more closely. I am the Lord, he had just been told, who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give this land to possess. Instantly, Abraham unburdened his anxiety. O oh Lord God, he asked, how am I to know that I shall possess it? To confirm and guarantee his promise, the Lord proceeded to make a solemn covenant with Abraham after the custom of the times, sealed with the blood of sacrifice. 
At the same time, he outlined his plans. Your descendants will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be slaves there, and they will be oppressed for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation which they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. This remarkable prophecy illustrates how detailed are God's plans and how precise in his foreknowledge. See now how accurately it was fulfilled. Abraham becomes the father of a son called Isaac. His grandson Jacob had 12 sons whose offspring formed the 12 tribes of Israel. As predicted, the Israelites moved south into Egypt, a foreign land in the time of famine. Their numbers grow and they are enslaved by the pharaohs. Moses, with whom we began our story, is given the task of leading them out. After ten dramatic plagues or disasters had brought Egypt to its knees, <coughs> the night eventually came when the Israelites were to leave. So scared were the Egyptians of the God of Israel that they pressed their valuables on the former slaves. Jewelry of silver and of gold and clothing, they let them have. They let them have what they asked. Thus they despoiled the Egyptians. That's Exodus 12, 35 and 36. The record notes, almost casually, the time that the people of Israel, Israel dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. Just a note in passing. Yet every detail of the prophecy had now come true. The sojourn in a foreign land, the slavery, the taking of a spoil, and 400 years, all precisely as predicted. But there were moral implications to the prophecy as well. God had judged the Egyptians through the catastrophic plagues for their ill treatment of Abraham's people. Moreover, the Israelites were now on their way to the same land where Abraham had pitched his tents. Four generations had gone by, and the inhabitants had filled it with violence and open immorality. In God's eyes, the iniquity of the Amorites, of the inhabitants of the land of Canaan, or Palestine, was now full. Thus Moses explained to the eager Israelites, Not because of your righteousness are you going in to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God is driving them out from before you. Deuteronomy 9 and 5. This brief introduction shows us how immensely complex is God's control of human affairs. As the creator and sustainer of the earth, he oversees the rise and fall of nations according to their moral standards. He detained the Israelites in Egypt so that having experienced slavery and suffering, they could value freedom. At the same time, he allowed four generations of the Amorites the opportunity to repent from the evil ways of their fathers and then displace them by the Israelites. As the Apostle Paul once wrote of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. We must press on to see the next stage of his great plan for Israel and their land. At the start of their wilderness journey, Moses brought to the Israelites the law of God. This great national code not only restrained crime, but lifted people up to show love and respect for the poor, the alien, and even their enemies. On the slopes of Mount Sinai, he joined the people to God in the great covenant, sealed like Abraham's with the blood of sacrifices, under which they agreed to keep those commandments. In return, God promised them a long and happy life in the land he was given to them. However, there was conditions. Their continued possession of the land was dependent on their obedience. If, like the Amorites, they defiled it with blood and barbarity, their tenancy would be terminated. This brings us to the next remarkable prophecy about Israel, in which Moses was able to foretell their history for hundreds, even thousands of years. To memorialize their agreement with God, he pronounced on the people a series of blessings and cursings, which they were to recite aloud and write down for a witness on entering the land. They are to be found in Deuteronomy chapter 28. The first, the first 14 verses are concerned with the blessings they would enjoy if they were obedient. The rest of the long chapter outlines the troubles God would bring upon them with increasing intensity if, if they failed to honor their promise. At, at first their economy would go wrong, their reins would fail, the crops would shrivel, their enemies would get the better of them, and foreign kings would rule over them. As the pressure increased, they would be invaded and besieged and taken away into captivity. Eventually, Moses warned, The Lord will scatter you among peoples from one end of the earth to the other. And among these nations you shall find no ease, and there shall be no rest for the sole of your foot. 
Night and day shall you be in dread, and have no assurance of your life. Verse by verse, it was a terrifying catalog of growing calamity. The amazing thing is, it all came true. After the 40 years wandering, the Israelites took over the land of the Amorites. <coughs> Ruled by leaders called judges for 500 years, they reached the pinnacle of their power and prosperity in the time of their, of their early kings, David and Solomon. Their devotion to the Lord and their obedience to his law had brought about the blessings promised by Moses. But then slowly they drifted away from God. They imported the worship of foreign gods from the nations around them. They preserved an outward form of piety in observing the festivals and sacrifices of the law, but neglected to care for the poor and oppressed. Inevitably, the curses began to bite. Neighboring countries like the Syrians and Edomites encroached upon their territory. The mighty Assyrians crossed the Euphrates, put them to tribute, then deported 10 of the 12 tribes into captivity. God was extremely patient with his people. Through the prophets, great men like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, he sent them constant reminders that they were breaking their promises to keep his laws. Wash yourselves, Isaiah pleaded. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. It's Isaiah 1 and 16. But the response was not there. Eventually, around 587 BC, the Babylonians captured Jerusalem and took Judah and Benjamin away. For 70 years, the land was empty of all but the poorest Jews. After that time, a proportion were allowed to return from Babylon. They picked up the thread of national life without a king and were subject in turn to the Persians, Greeks, and Romans. It was into their oppressed world that Jesus of Nazareth was born. The sending of Jesus was, was God's most poignant appeal to his people. In the parable of the vineyard, Jesus likened the people of Israel to the tenants of a vineyard. When God, the owner, sent his servants, the prophets, to collect the rent, they beat them up and sent them away. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be they will respect him. And they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Luke 20, 13 through 5. Jesus knew too well what lay ahead of him. He also knew that God's wrath would shortly burst over the head of his listeners. Fill up, he cried, the measures of your fathers. Matthew 23 and 32. Like the Amorites before them, Israel was filling up the measuring part of their iniquity. The vineyard would be given to others. Thirty years after Jesus was crucified, the Jews rebelled against Rome. A strong army being besieged and captured Jerusalem, filling the streets with corpses and destroying the temple. Another sixty years in the revolt of AD 132 sealed their fate. Hundreds of thousands of Jews were sold into slavery increasing the already substantial Jewish populations of many provinces of the Roman Empire and beyond. The Israelites, as Moses had foreseen, became the wandering Jews to be found in practically every country of the world, despised, reviled, and hounded by persecution from city to city. For long centuries, exactly as the Christians had worn, they had no rest for the soles of their feet. The murder of God's Son was the ultimate act of rebellion by the chosen people. Yet even that wicked deed had been anticipated in God's plan. The Apostle Peter, speaking to the Jews in Jerusalem six weeks after the event, insisted that Jesus had been delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Acts 2 verse 23. Indeed, the prophet Isaiah in his heart-rending chapter 53 had predicted long beforehand Jesus' suffering. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Why, you may ask, did God allow his only son to die in shame and agony? The answer is complex, and yet it is central to God's plan to save men from their sins. On that hill outside Jerusalem, God brought the self-denial and grace and love of Jesus face to face with the human lust of pride, envy, and cruelty which are all in our hearts in which the Bible calls sins. For three days, sin appeared to have triumphed, but Jesus, the sinless, rose from the grave after that short time, so breaking the power of death for those who believe in him. He was bruised, Isaiah continues, for our iniquities, and with his stripes we are healed. It's verse 5. So when those conscience-stricken Jews, realizing they had killed God's Son, asked Peter on the day of Pentecost, what should they do? He explained that the risen Christ 
had become a sacrifice that could take their guilt away. He said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness, forgiveness of your sins. The immediate response was impressive. 3,000 Jews were baptized. But with the passage of time, it became clear that the majority of God's chosen people remained unconvinced. The pride in being descended from Abraham had blinded them to the need for faith that quality which entitled Abraham to be called the friend of God. This rejection of the gospel by the Jews, followed by their final scattering, might lead one to conclude that God has finished with the Jews. Paul addresses himself to precisely this question in Romans chapter 11. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew, he writes, verse 2. Although as a nation Israel had turned her back on God, there were individuals within the nation who did respond, such as those who listened to Peter on the day of Pentecost. And that was all that mattered. As Moses taught, numbers are unimportant to God. Quality matters more than quantity. So too at the present time, Paul continues, there is a remnant chosen by grace. Nothing had gone wrong with God's plan. The scattering of Israel simply meant it was entering a new phase. As a Jewish political organization tottered toward its end, the call of the gospel was dramatically widened. For the first time, Gentiles were invited to share in the privilege of knowing the eternal God. Paul was the foremost and most energetic leader of this preaching to the Gentiles. It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken first to you, he declared to the Jews at Antioch. God's people had been given the first opportunity to hear the good news about Jesus. However, since you thrust it from you, he continued, and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, Behold, we turn to the Gentiles. That is anybody non, non born in Israel, the nations. Acts 13 and 46. Gentiles are people of any other nation in Israel. Though through the work of the apostles and the spread of the scriptures, the door has been opened to people like you and me to come close to God. We can become chosen people with the same promises and enjoying the same fatherly care that God bestowed on Abraham and his descendants. There is neither Jew nor Greek, Paul wrote to the Galatians, for you all are one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Galatians 3, verse 28 and 29. Once you were no people, adds Peter, quoting from the prophecy of Hosea, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 1 Peter 2 and 10. In Romans 11, again, Paul compares Israel to a fine olive tree which regrettably produced no fruit. God has pruned out the barren branches and replaced them instead with wild olive shoots grafted into the ancient trunk. These Gentile olive shoots now share the rich sap of the parent tree. The fall of Israel was the Gentiles' opportunity. It is worth noting that as with Israel, so with the Gentiles, the response to the call is still limited to individuals. The remnant principle still applies James, another apostle, put it crisply, crisply when he described the call of the first Gentiles, Cornelius and his household. God first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name, Acts 15 and 14. It will only ever be a few who are taken out, selected by their response to the call to repentance. And the conditions for acceptance by God are still faith and obedience, just as they were for Abraham. This new phase of God's plan, the call of the Gentiles, has been running for nearly 2,000 years, a period as long as the call of Israel. We are now ready to move on and ask whether the Bible reveals yet further stages to God's plan ahead in the future. On the campus of the Tel Aviv University in Israel, there stands a remarkable museum, I'm going to probably not say this right, but called Beth Hadafutsoth, which means House of the Dispersion. It is a graceful new building packed with the very latest in audiovisual aids. It aims to show young Jews of today how their fathers preserved their beliefs and culture during centuries of wandering, how they kept themselves pure from intermarriage, and how they returned to the land of their dreams. In a darkened, bowl-shaped auditorium, rays of light project onto the curved ceiling. Above the audience, a world map where tiny stars represent the known communities of Jews from the times of Assyria, Babylon and Rome onwards. Practically every country of the world has received Jews at some time. 
As the centuries pass by, the stars in the display move eerily as persecution drives the Jews from one country to another. France, Germany, Spain, Poland, Great Britain, each act of terror is cataloged in lights. Sometimes the lights go out as whole communities pass into oblivion. Then, amazingly, the pinpoints of lights begin to move back to the land of Israel as the return gets underway in the 20th century. Whole galleries of the Beth Hadafutos Museum are devoted to the fortunes of Jewish communities in particular lands. A pagoda-style synagogue modeled on one in Peking, a reconstruction of a wedding in the Ukraine, a Jewish rabbi pleading for his life before a Jesuit priest in the Inquisition, and most moving of all, in letters of fire, the last words penned by Jews who faced death in the German Holocaust. The pace and emotion quicken as the exhibition reaches the last joyful stages of the return. Everything is painstakingly chronicled. First come the thoughts of a national home penned by Wiseman from Russia and the Tsars. The publishing of Herzl's The Jewish State in 1896 in the Zionist Congress of 1897. There follows the slow, grinding labor of the early settlements in Palestine under the Turks. The British mandate after the First World War allows more and more Jews to return. Finally, the agony of Hitler's repression creates an irresistible pressure in Europe and precip precipitates a chain of events leading finally to the formation of the State of Israel in 1948. Since those exciting days, as we know, hardly a day goes by without some mention of the tiny state in our newspapers. No bigger than Wales, with a population two-thirds that of London, Israel is now prominent in world affairs. The Suez Crisis of 1956, the Six-Day War in 1967, the Yom Kippur Battles in October 1973, the invasion of Le Lebanon in 1984, whether you resent or admire the prowess, the Israelis have a new, vital national spirit that defies all the rules of history. Never before has a nation been driven systematically from its land, survived 25 centuries of uprooting, and come back to life on its ancient hills with such remarkable vigor. What, we must ask, is the meaning of all this? Is it some fantastic coincidence that God's people should survive when so many other nations in history have perished? There is a straightforward answer. Right at the end of the blessings and cursings we looked at in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses wrote these significant words. When all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, in return to the Lord your God, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion upon you, and he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you and will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. It's Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 through 5. The return is no accident of history. It is the deliberate act of a loving, merciful God. Jeremiah puts it just as plainly. I am with you to save you, says the Lord. I will make a full end of all the nations among you whom I scattered you, but of you I will not make a full end. How true were those words? The Assyrians, the Babylonians, and the Romans who scattered Israel have disappeared, but the Jews survived. I have loved you with an everlasting love, the prophet goes on. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Or Ezekiel, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. And the land that was desolate shall be tilled, instead of being the desolation that it was in the sight of all who passed by. We could go on. There are many, many similar prophecies in the Old Testament, each describing aspects of the return we have been witnessing in our own time. There is no doubt it is the work of God himself. Now ask yourself, why should God want the Jews back in their ancient homeland? What is it leading up to? The answer to that question is the most dramatic of all. It is the coming of the kingdom of God. Before you scoff at this idea, just listen again to the words of the angel Gabriel to Mary, the mother-to-be of Jesus. He will be great, and the Lord God will give, him, will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. 
Did Jesus reign over the Jews when he was on the earth before? The answer is no. We have no king but Caesar, they cried. They rejected him and he was crucified. But Jesus rose from the dead to an immortal, to an immortal life. A king who reigns forever needs to be immortal. That prophecy of Gabriel requires an immortal Jesus to return to Jerusalem where David's throne was and rule over a land populated by Jews. 100 years ago, this would not have been possible. The Jews were still scattered and the Turks ruled over the holy city. Today we find it, we find the land inhabited by nearly 4 million Jews and by other ethnic groups as well. In Jerusalem, once more, the capital of Israel. Consider again the promise of Jesus to his apostles. I appoint for you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That is Luke 22, 29, and 30. For this simple, straightforward blessing to be given to Peter, James, John, and their fellows, they must be brought back from the dead, for none of them reigned over Israel in his lifetime. There must also be an Israel for them to reign over, with Jesus. All of this is entirely possible today. Israel has survived, and God has brought Israel back to their land in preparation for the kingdom of God. There is absolutely no doubt that Jesus is going to come back from heaven, and then will come the time of reward for all those who, like the apostles, have followed him faithfully. Jesus tells us this plainly in the parable of the nobleman who went into a far country to receive kingly power and then return. You can find that in Luke 19, 11 through 27. During his absence, he left his servants to look after his business interests. Significantly, the citizens of the country sent a message to, after him to say, We do not want this man to reign over us. Jesus spoke this parable, Luke says, because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. Jerusalem was the place of David's throne. Jesus, the disciples believed, was the king, and they thought he was going to reign there and then. But the time was not right. He had to suffer for the sins of men and rise from the dead and go away to his father's right hand for 19 long centuries. Jesus himself is the nobleman in heaven, the far country. The Jews who were supposed to be his people rejected him, just as the parable said, but see how it concludes. At his return, having received the kingdom, the nobleman inspects his household and promotes his loyal and industrious servants to positions of honor, reigning over ten cities or five cities, according to their ability. At the same time, his enemies are slain. The time for the nobleman to return is very near. We must prepare for the day of inspection. Looking into the future, so far we have been given, we have been following God's plan steadily through to the late 20th century. Does the Bible permit us to lift the curtain and see beforehand the sequence of events which occur as the kingdom of God begins to replace the world of today? The answer is a qualified yes. The problem, the problem is there are many prophecies to fit together. It is like assembling the pieces of a huge jigsaw puzzle where the broad outline is clear but the details do not yet all fall into place. Firstly, it is plain that the Jews themselves must undergo spirit, spiritual renewal before they are fit for Jesus to be their king. It is a sad fact that devotion to God, which was so real to them during the dispersion and persecution, has been abandoned by so many now that they have returned. There has to be a major change of heart before they can truly become God's people. We saw this in the beautiful passage from Ezekiel describing the return. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. Ezekiel 36 and 25. Malachi writes of Elijah the prophet being sent like John the Baptist was before the great and terrible day the Lord comes to prepare God's people for the coming of Jesus. No doubt a minority of the people will respond to this message as they did in the first century. For the majority, however, the day comes burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evil doers will be stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up, Malachi 4 and 1. The catastrophe that purges those Jews living in the land of Israel is to be a mighty invasion by an army made up of many nations, combining forces to attack and at last to, to capture Jerusalem, the jewel in Israel's crown. The theme comes across in numerous passages, and I ask you to pay attention to this because I'm going to show you a little video that's a news clipping. It's 
nothing to do with Christadelphians, just, just things that are going on in the world. It says, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, right, Zechariah, and the city shall be taken and the houses plundered. I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, outside Jerusalem. That's Joel 3 and 2. <clears throat> you will bestir yourself, Ezekiel says, to go, the prince of Meshach and Tubal, which is ancient names for Russia, and come from your place out of the uttermost parts of the north, you and many peoples with you. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud covering the land. Ezekiel 38, 14 through 16. Somehow this invasion is not just against Israel, but against God himself and his son. The kings of the earth set themselves, St. David in Psalm 2, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed Christ, saying, let us burst their bonds asunder, verses 2 and 3. This video here is a small example of what we are looking for to happen in the world, according to Bible prophecy. We see Israel in a bad spot, nations flexing their military might, and Russia becoming directly involved in the Middle East under the control, under the control of Vladimir Putin. I'm going to show you this video. It's about three minutes long. Syria story. Russia putting battleships in Syria, and I think you have reports that they're being joined by China and others. What is going on there? We have news. It's tentative news until it's confirmed, confirmed. But the news is alarming. This is a very major a exercise. Combined air, land, and sea involving Russia, Black Sea Fleet elements, air assault divisions, Spesnaz troops, and Iran, and Syria, and to be joined by China, warships from China. That also includes the very likely uh, scenario where Iran and China have already received permission to pass warships through the Suez Canal. To my knowledge, this is alarming for the whole region, but especially Israel. The backstory, Larry, quickly. Back in the, the UN uh, Security Council resolution against Libya, Russia helped broker that deal, and Gaddafi was to accept internal exile, I am told. The UN, uh, the, Russia believes that it was betrayed by the Secretary of State, by the UN Ambassador, and by the Obama administration, and Gaddafi's death told Russia not to trust the US. Therefore, there will be no climbing down on Syria. Russia intends to back the Assad regime all the way. Mr. Putin is now in charge. Mr. Medvedev, the former president, backstory again. He was humiliated when Russia was betrayed in Libya. He has not regained his status since then. Mr. Putin will not make that mistake. R Russia is an energy superpower. They're also deploying major combat elements, Larry. I'm told Air Assault Division, Combined Arms D Division, the Marines from the Black Sea Fleet are on their way to Syria right now. This is boots on the ground. There'll be perhaps 400 aircraft involved. In addition, specialists, Spesnats, GRU units, everybody out there who knows about special forces, this is the Russian equivalent. These are veterans from the Chechen guerrilla war. The scenario that are entertaining is in the event of a NATO intervention from the west or north in Syria. You see they're making it very clear there will be no military option for the United States. So there is no option for the U.S. at all. This is a severe setback for the Obama administration. When and if this military exercise takes place, it is clearly in the face of the Obama administration's negotiations with Iran. Putin has played a very strong card. All right. Thank you, John Baxter. We're going to have to leave it there. Things. We have God's word, which alone should be enough to make doubly sure He has given us an oath as well. It means we cannot just doubt the promise will come true. We have this, he concludes, as our sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. Thank you.